name is Tia Higano. I'm a medical oncologist at University of Washington, and I'm here today with Dr. Maha Hussain, who is the Genevieve Tutin Professor of Medicine and Deputy Director of the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Dr. Hussein uh, presented the profound trial at the 2019 ESMO meeting in Barcelona, and she is going to uh, walk us through this data. Um, Dr. Hussein, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Higano. It's my pleasure, and thank you for including me. Of course. So, Maha, could you walk us through the background of why we even were interested in studying a lap rib in this specific pa patient population uh, with homologous recombination repair defects? Sure. So as you know, um, the role of uh, the homologous repair story uh, and DNA repair defect started long before prostate cancer in other cancers, specifically breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Um, and the Stand Up to Cancer effort um, that occurred in the early 2010s, 2011s, I believe, uh, basically was targeted at evaluating the molecular profile or the genomics profile of metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. And as illustrated in this particular slide, uh, as a background, men had metastatic castration-resistant disease, frontline progressive progression, they uh, underwent a metastatic disease biopsy and their tumors were sequenced. And what was interesting is that um, it's somewhere around 20% or greater of patients um, had tumors that harbored DNA repair pathway aberrations. The most common of those were the BRCA1, 2, and um, ATM, and there were others. Now, as part of the Stand Up to Cancer, there were several clinical trials, but one specific one was the um, TOPARP uh, trial, which basically um, was a clinical trial that was done in men who had metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer that has progressed on prior um, uh, therapy. Um, and there, these patients' uh, tumors were included as part of the Stand Up to Cancer uh, genomic sequencing. And what was interesting um, is the fact uh, on your left-hand side um, uh, here, you'll see that um, the, um, the, the patients that had the higher response rate with, a, with Olaparib was in patients who had DNA repair defect alterations as opposed to those with it, with, without. And then on the right-hand side, uh, you will see that, um, in fact, this was uh, translated not just with response rate, but with regard to progression-free survival, PSA responses, and overall survival. So that really uh, prompted um, the, um, uh, the design um, of a phase three trial to try to answer the specific um, question. And so that brings us to the study design for Profound. Great. Why don't you uh, walk us through that, tell us who the patients were in terms of eligibility sure. and some of the key findings. Certainly. So um, the, the eligibility criteria are highlighted in here. The key criteria were that men had to have um, metastatic castration-resistant disease that has progressed uh, on prior new hormonal agent. Uh, such as abiraterone or enzalutamide, and they were required to have alterations in at least one or more of the qualifying genes with direct or indirect role uh, in homologous repair recombination. I should point out that all the tissue was centrally um, tested. Men were stratified by previous taxane and the presence or absence of measurable disease, and then they were included in two distinct cohorts. Cohort A was men who had BRCA1, or ATM, and cohort B was any other alteration that was related to DNA repair uh, defect pathway. And the rationale for uh, the separation of the cohort is because the bulk of the data when we started the, the, the when we designed the trial was specifically um, with the with the patients who had the BRCA1, 2, or ATM. In both cohorts, men were randomized two to one. This was an open label. 
um, in, uh, with uh, Elaparib, 300 milligram uh, twice a day, which is standard dose versus the physician choice uh, of abiraterone or enzalutamide. And this was the same, again, for the cohort B. And then the primary endpoint was uh, uh, radiographic progression-free survival, which was assessed by a central independent blinded review. So upon progression in each of these two cohorts, men who were on the elap uh, I'm sorry, on the physician choice arm were allowed to cross over um, to elaparib. The primary endpoint was radiographic progression-free survival uh, in cohort A, which was based on RESIST uh, 1.1 and uh, prostate cancer working group criteria. Again, all based on an independent central review, and listed in here are several secondary endpoints, uh, end including radiographic progression-free survival in the overall cohort, confirmed objective response rates, time to pain progression in cohort A, and overall survival in cohort A. Great. And what did you find? Okay. So here is the, uh, the summary of the patient characteristics. And um, I want to just highlight that uh, overall the arms were fairly balanced. With the, uh, there was the appearance of perhaps a higher PSA and, um, uh, in, in, in the, in the um, uh, cohort, um, in the, I'm sorry, the physician choice uh, component as opposed to the elaborative arm in cohort A. However, the uh, interquartile were really comparable. This is a very heavily pretreated patient population. As you see here, uh, these patients have seen um, uh, enzalutamide abiraterone at least in 20% of the times or, or so. Um, uh, basically have seen both of these agents previously. Um, uh, over 60% of these men have seen um, docetaxel, uh, I'm sorry, have seen chemotherapy, docetaxel being the most common agent. However, um, uh, somewhere about, again, 20% uh, of the patients have seen both docetaxel and cabazitaxel. So again, a heavily pretreated patient population. Uh, the interesting thing is that um, uh, men in their late um, 80s and, in fact, even early 90s were included in this trial, highlighting the feasibility of, uh, of doing um, uh, this particular uh, or administration of this particular agent. Um, the overall treatment was well tolerated. The uh, adverse events or toxicity profile was very uh, consistent with what has been known for elaborate previously. Um, anemia was the most frequent adverse event uh, with high-grade anemia occurring in about 21.5% um, uh, of patients. I should point out this should be taken into consideration. Aside from the effect of the drug itself, this is a patient that has, um, uh, again, been heavily pretreated previously with extensive um, uh, bone metastases. Um, uh, the, uh, the other uh, adverse events were generally um, low grade and again consistent with what has seen be, with what has seen previously uh, with Alaparib. Um, with regard to the efficacy endpoints, as I mentioned, the primary endpoint was radiographic progression free survival uh, in cohort A, and as you see here, there was a clinically meaningful and statistically significant improvement in radiographic progression-free survival with a 66% reduction in the risk of death or progression uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.34 and a very significant p-value. I do want to point out to the audience that the separation of the curve occurred very early in the, in the course of the treatment, and the um, uh, experimental arm of um, elaparib continued to do better um, as going far out at 12 months or even 16, uh, I'm sorry, 18 months um, afterwards. The other endpoints, um, which are the secondary endpoints, was the radiographic progression-free survival in cohort A and B. Similarly, there was a statistically significant clinically, clinically meaningful um, difference uh, with regard to um, the radiographic progression-free survival. Uh, patients who had measurable disease in cohort A had a much higher rate of objective response um, uh, in favor of the elaborate treatment compared to um, the standard of care uh, oral agents. Uh, time to pain progression is the median has not been reached in the in cohort A, 
uh, and again, significant difference in um, uh, median time to pain progression. And um, there is uh, trends that are favorable, uh, although I should point out it's not mature. So while the p-value looks like mature, like it's significant, it's not mature data yet. We're anticipating uh, final survival data sometime uh, next year, but the trends uh, appear to be also favorable in favor of um, elaborate therapy. So, Maha, this is really um, a landmark study in many ways because of the fact it's the first phase three study, uh, I think as you pointed out in your ESMO presentation, where a biomarker, um, you know, was found to have um, a positive uh, relationship to outcome with, treat with treatment of a targeted drug. So, how do you how do you think these findings will impact the practice uh, going forward for treating men with metastatic CRPC? Um, Tia, I think this is, uh, as you point out, it's a landmark event uh, or finding because up to now, our approach in managing this group of patients have been pretty much one size fits all approach. Um, assuming the FDA will favorably review this, and obviously that's the ultimate um, hope, uh, that this drug is going to be available, I do think that it changes the way we practice with regard to uh, incorporating the role of genomics for the purpose of uh, targeted treatment in the management of prostate cancer. And I would recommend that early on, as patients are um, have metastatic disease uh, or are in the beginning of developing castration-resistant disease, it would be ideal to actually check their uh, tumor genomics. And we can certainly talk about germline issues, but definitely the tumor genomics to be tested uh, in preparation for potential PARP inhibitor therapy. Right, and I think the NCCN guidelines even address that now. So do you think that um, PARP inhibitors should be used earlier in the course of prostate cancer, whether it be castration-resistant disease or not? So I would say that uh, probably randomly no. However, as you know, um, in the field, not just uh, of GU oncology, but oncology in gen and cancer in general, Advancing effective treatment to earlier stages of disease, uh, so these are effective treatment in end-stage disease, moving them into earlier stage of disease gives you a better return on investment, so to speak, in terms of outcomes. And I think we've seen multiple signals, uh, taxotere being moved to the hormone-sensitive space, um, enzalutamide, apalutamide, abiraterin, and so on. I do think we have to prove what, what our gut feeling is telling us. So I do think that uh, clinical trials are definitely needed in the earlier stages of the disease to uh, evaluate the efficacy and certainly look at even earlier combination type therapies um, because there is, again, emerging data on co-targeting AR and DNA repair. Uh, and so the question comes up, does one get much better return on investment uh, uh, moving the treatment into the at least metastatic hormone sensitive space, non-metastatic castration resistant space, uh, because that would give you the fastest read uh, for, from, a, from a clinical trial perspective. Right. So I guess many of those trials are ongoing now. So in the future, hopefully we'll have a better understanding of where to position PARP inhibitors. What, Maha, why don't you just summarize um, the results specifically in terms of which patients seem to have the greatest benefit from a laparib in the PROFOUND trial? So um, the, the data, uh, which I showed at ESMO, uh, essentially suggests that uh, definitely, um, uh, the BRCA2 patients appear to have the, big the b biggest uh, improvement. Um, we actually looked in cohort B uh, at different uh, subgroups of men um, with different alterations. And what I think is fascinating is there were multiple um, subgroups um, specifically patients who had um, RAD um, uh, 61B, RAD um, 64L, uh, CHECK2. To my surprise, actually, um, 
uh, CDK12, appear to have also um, uh, what appears to be an improvement uh, over the control uh, by, you know, from from Alaparib. Um But at the end of the day, as I said, it's um, a lot of these subgroup analyses tend to be exploratory in nature, and they're certainly not powered, um, but the trends are definitely there. I would say the strongest benefit is still in BRCA2. There's also benefit in ATM and BRCA1, but not to the magnitude of the BRCA2. So I would say from a, from a practical perspective, in the setting of patients who have progressed on frontline Abbey or Enza, and we know that they have DNA repair d defects in their tumors, whether it's germline or, uh, or somatic, uh, I think that um, uh, trying a PARP inhibitor, certainly, if it can be covered uh, pending FDA approval, um, I think this is something that's worthwhile considering. Great. Well, Maha, I want to congratulate you on being involved with the LAPRIB from the very beginning as you showed the stand up to cancer data and bringing this into this phase three trial. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, it's been great hearing your, your discussion. Thank you, Tia. Thank you for the opportunity.